Because of the way electrons are added to elements and we add electrons one at a time in the row and then we start a new shell and we fill up that new shell in the second row and start a new shell and fill up a new shell in the third row. Because of that, elements that are in the same column have similar electron configurations. And because they have similar electron configurations, they have similar, similar chemical properties because a, uh, an element's chemical properties are based on uh, how it trades electrons with other elements. So um, we can see some trends within the periodic table and we can see that elements within a family have similar chemical properties and we can see that uh, elements um, in general follow these trends which is that ionization energy and electronegativity and electron affinity, all three of these properties increase from the left to the right, they get bigger. And they also get bigger going from the bottom to the top. So here you can see this one and this one and this one. Um, those, are, those arrows are opposite these. Atomic radius points down and points to the left. So that means that this atom here has the largest atomic radius. But it means that these atoms up here have the largest electronegativity and ionization energy and electron affinity. We can also see a property called metallic character, how, how, um, how much an element conforms to the properties of an ideal metal. So as uh, we look down and to the left of the periodic table, elements become more metallic. So that's a similar trend as atomic radius, really down and to the left. And non-metallic character increases as we go up and to the right. So these elements up here are the least metallic, and these elements down here are the most metallic. So the first um, trend that we'll look at on the periodic table is atomic radius. There are several methods for measuring the radius of an atom, and they all give slightly different numbers. So we can measure the radius of an atom uh, remember the radius is from the middle to the edge. The reason that this is not as straightforward as it might seem is because what is the edge of an atom? Remember that the atom on the outside has electrons, and remember that those electrons are in orbitals, and, the, and we, can't, we don't know exactly where the electron is because of the uncertainty principle. So where is the edge of the atom? That's not necessarily a well-defined boundary. So it's hard to draw a line from the middle to the edge. So there are several ways of coming up with a, a, a radius for an atom. One is a non-bonding radius. And the way that we might do that is um, in krypton, krypton's a noble gas. So noble gas atoms do not bond with each other. So two krypton atoms are uh, not ever going to form a bond. But if we get them really, really, really cold and we can turn krypton into a solid, that's almost near zero Kelvin, almost near absolute zero this happens. Well, when we turn Krypton into a solid, then the atoms are stuck right next to each other and they can't move. That's what a solid is. So in a solid, if I can measure the distance from one atom, the center of one atom to the center of another atom in a solid, then taking half of that distance, we could assume is the radius of the atom. There's one radius right here and here's one radius right here. So that's one way of calculating the radius of an atom. Another way is within a bond. If two atoms are bonded together, two atoms of bromine, for example, are bonded together, then we can measure the distance between the nuclei in that molecule, between bromine atoms in that molecule. And we do the same thing. We assume that from here to here is the, uh, the radius of this bromine atom, and from here to here is the radius of this bromine atom. So we divide that distance in two, uh, divide it by two. So um, this uh, either method for determining the atomic radius is would be equally valid, but they're going to give different numbers. We can see this one's probably going to underestimate the, uh, the radius, although it's hard to say because it's, remember this edge is not very clearly defined. So the atomic radius is not necessarily a set number. It's something that is up for interpretation to some extent because we don't know where the edge of the atom is. So this chart shows us what the trend in atomic radius is. Here's hydrogen and helium. So hydrogen, believe it or not, is actually bigger than helium. 
a helium atom is the smallest atom. It's even smaller than hydrogen, which is counterintuitive because hydrogen has one proton, zero neutrons, and one electron. And helium has two protons and two neutrons and two electrons. So far more particles in a helium atom, yet the helium atom has a smaller radius. Um, some of that is because of the way it's measured, but uh, most of that is because of the way that the nucleus in, in the middle of an atom as we go across a row, from left to right across a row in the periodic table, the nucleus pulls harder and harder on the electrons within that same shell. So at the beginning of the row, the nucleus does not have the as does not pull as hard on the electrons in the outer shell. Uh, but by the time we get to the end of that row, then the nucleus, the nuclear charge is really pulling pretty hard on the um, electrons in the outermost shell. So um, hydrogen, helium, that's the end of the first row. Adding a second shell from helium to lithium, adding a second shell of electrons increases the radius substantially. Right? So this is just adding one electron into one s orbital, adding a second electron into the one s orbital. These are both in the first shell. So adding a second one actually makes it get smaller um, because of the nuclear charge on helium. But when we add a second shell, and now that, second, that first shell is full, adding a second shell really increases the radius. But again, uh, from there, the next element is even smaller than lithium. Lithium is the biggest element in, this, in the second row. So it goes lithium, and then it goes beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon. So um, you can see that carbon, uh, or excuse me, this is nitrogen, is down here. Oxygen is a little bit higher, and then fluorine is a little bit lower and then neon. And then that's the end of the second row, and when we add a third shell of electrons, again, there's a huge jump between the end of the second row and the beginning of the third row, between the end of the third row and the beginning of the fourth row, because adding another shell adds a lot to the radius. But counterintuitively, as we go across a row, the elements get smaller and smaller. So this is um, something that most people don't expect. Lithium is the biggest atom in this whole row. It seems like if we're reading from left to right that it should be smaller, a little bigger, 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 biggest. And then we start over. But that's actually the opposite of what happens. Lithium is the biggest, and as we move from left to right, they get smaller and smaller, and neon is the smallest one in this row. And then sodium is the biggest one in this row, and argon is the smallest one in this row. Potassium is the biggest, krypton is the smallest. So they actually get smaller as you go from left to right. And the reason for that is because uh, um, when we're talking about the nucleus of an atom having a positive charge and the electrons are attracted to the nucleus, um, the negative electrons are stuck to the positive nucleus, well across a row we're always adding electrons into the same shell. So in that first atom, the first um, element that's in the row, this is a, an atom of lithium, and we know that because it has three uh, positive charges in the nucleus. Three protons means lithium. So as I add electrons to this atom, uh, I'm trying to change the color here. As I add electrons, I've got one in there now, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We can hold eight electrons in that second shell. Every time I add an electron into the shell, it's always going into the second shell. So that one's in the second shell, and that one, and that one, and so on, and they're always going into the second shell. But every time I add an electron, for example, if I add an electron uh, to lithium, generally I'm adding a proton too. So cross this out, then we get four plus. When I have four plus, I have four electrons. And then we're gonna have five plus. When I have five plus, I have five electrons. And then the sixth atom has six plus, and we'll have six electrons. You see what I'm doing is every time I add uh, an, an electron, I'm also adding a proton because the atoms are neutral, right? 
So what's happening? All right, so as we add protons, we're also adding electrons. So there's one, two, three electrons in lithium. One, two, three, four electrons in beryllium. One, two, three, four, five electrons in boron. Three, four, five, six electrons in carbon, and so on. So we're always adding electrons into the same shell as we go across this, uh, as we go across the periodic table this way. Every subsequent electron gets added into the same shell, the second shell in this case. But as I'm going across, I'm also adding protons. I add one electron, four electrons, but I also add one proton, four protons. So the positive charge here pulls on these electrons. This is a 3 plus charge, so it can pull a little bit. This is a 4 plus charge, so it can pull a little bit more. This is a 5 plus charge, so it can pull a little bit more. This is a 6 plus charge, so it can pull a little bit more. So the as the electrons are always going into the same shell, the charge in the middle has a harder time pulling on those outer electrons until it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and the larger the charge gets as we go across the row the tighter it gets so the elements actually start to get smaller and smaller and smaller because the nuclear charge in the middle pulls on those outer electrons tighter and tighter and tighter until we finally get uh, plus seven eight plus I'm just gonna skip a couple here nine plus 10 plus, this is at the end of the row. At the end of the row, it's really small because that 10 plus can really pull really hard. The 10 plus charge pulls really hard on those electrons. But then when we start over in the next row, at 11 plus, 2, oops, what happened there? 3. Now I've got another shell, and the next shell is really big. So I had one, two in the first shell, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in the second shell, and now one in the third shell. And that third shell is really far away. And as I add electrons, as I add protons to the center, it's going to pull that shell closer and closer and closer and closer. So when we look at the radius of an ion, we can tell whether the ion is going to be bigger than an atom or smaller than an atom depending on whether it's a cation or an anion. So remember cations are positive and positive cations, if an ion is positive that means it's lost an electron. So the radius of an atom is based on the, how many electrons are on the outside because how the outermost part of an atom is the electron. So if there's lots of electrons, an atom is big. If there's not very many electrons, the atom is small. So for cations, this is the size of a lithium atom when it's neutral. And then when it loses one electron, then the radius of the lithium cation is this big. It's much smaller. That means that that, that electron that lithium lost must be out here, electron, 
in this orbital. And if we lose that, that electron, then we lose that orbital. And the other two electrons in lithium are much closer to the nucleus in the 1s orbital. So here's a sodium atom, here's a sodium cation. Potassium atom, potassium cation. So in all cases, you can see that the, uh, the difference between the atom and the ion is that the cation is always smaller. But we can also see here that um, as we go across a row, not only does the atom get smaller, but the ions get smaller too. And that's because when I have a, a plus one charge, plus one extra proton in the nucleus provides extra pull on the electrons because when it's neutral, then, I, then protons and electrons are perfectly equal. But when I lose an electron, then I have one extra proton. So now the positive charge in the center is even stronger for those electrons, one extra proton stronger. When I lose calcium, when I lose two electrons on calcium, now the nuclear charge in the middle is plus two, so it it's, uh, has less shielding from those electrons, and the electrons that are left feel that nuclear charge even greater. Plus three is even greater. It pulls the electrons even tighter. So the larger the positive charge gets, the smaller the radius of the ion gets because that positive charge is really strong at pulling the electrons in. So the opposite happens with anions, as you can imagine. So with an anion, what I'm doing is adding electrons, right? Anions are negative. To have a negative ion, you have to add negative particles, and the negative particles are electrons. As you add electrons to an atom, then you're putting the electrons in an outer shell, and that adding electrons was going to increase the radius no matter what because the electrons are on the outside, right? As you add more, the, uh, it, the uh, radius gets larger. But also, as, I'm, as I go across a row, the reason that they get smaller, even though I'm adding electrons, the reason they get smaller is because as I add electrons, I'm also adding protons. But when I have an ion, O has eight protons, and O2 minus also has eight protons. So I'm not adding protons to this. The only thing I'm adding is electrons, two of them. And when I add two extra electrons to oxygen and I don't add any extra protons, those extra electrons um, really increase the radius of the atom because they, they can't be held very tightly by the nucleus because now there's eight protons in the nucleus and 10 electrons that are orbiting the nucleus. So eight plus in the middle cannot hold 10 minus very tightly. So those electrons get spread out kind of and the ion gets bigger. So that happens in general for all ions um, but you can see that uh, when there's two extra electrons, the effect is greater. And when there's one extra electron, the effect isn't quite as large. So we can see some numbers here. These seem fairly equivalent. Um, but when we get to this one, the, uh, actually these seem fairly equivalent too. So adding a second, um, a second electron does increase the radius a little bit, but not very significantly. These are fairly similar in size. Um, in fact, this one may even be smaller, the ion, the, as, as the atom, the change, versus the uh, chlorine with only one electron. So in general, when I have an anion, whether it's a two minus or a one minus, the anion in green here is going to have a larger radius than the atom that's neutral. So we add electrons to the outside. So um, we talked about shielding and penetration in a previous video. And remember, shielding is the idea that when there's electrons in an outer shell, they don't feel the positive charge of the nucleus quite as much as electrons in an inner shell, because those in an, ele in an outer shell are also repelled by the shell right underneath them. Electrons that are on the outside have lots of electrons underneath them, and those electrons are negative. So they're repelling the electrons on the outside. So one way that we can quantify this effect is by uh, calculating what we call the effective nuclear charge. And that's just the number of protons that are in the nucleus of an atom 
sub and you subtract the number of electrons that are in lower energy levels. So by lower energy levels, we mean um, anything that is uh, has a smaller principal quantum number. So if the valence shell is the fourth principal quantum number, n equals four, then the, we would add up the number of electrons in n equals three, n equals two, and n equals one, and that would become s. And so we take the number of protons in the atom and subtract the number of electrons in lower energy levels, and that becomes the effective nuclear charge. So here's uh, this picture again. We have a positive charge of three plus in the nucleus. Two electrons are in the first shell, the 1s orbital, and one electron is in the second shell, the 2s orbital. So the effective nuclear charge for this electron right here, these electrons right here feel the full nucleus because there's no electrons underneath them. They are in the first orbital. But this electron right here has these electrons underneath it. So this electron right here does not feel a three plus charge. What does it feel? Well, it has three plus the number of protons in the nucleus minus the number of electrons that are underneath it. One, two. So three minus two, equals one. So this electron in the outer shell, it doesn't feel a charge of plus three. This one feels a charge of plus one. So that means it's held to the nucleus much less tightly than the inner electrons, which are held to the nucleus very tightly. There's no electrons underneath them to repel them. Um, the ionization energy is the energy needed to remove an electron from an atom or an ion. So to ionize something, there's, there's really two ways to do it. I can make a cation or an anion. But when we're talking about ionization energy, we're talking about making a cation. So we're talking about removing electrons from something. We're pulling the electrons away. In order to pull an electron away from an atom or an ion, that takes energy because plus and minus are, are stuck together like magnets. So if I'm going to try to pull an electron away from an atom that, it, that it's stuck to like a magnet, stuck to the nucleus, that's going to take energy. So when we measure ionization energy, we measure it in the gas state. We're talking about atoms that are not liquids or solids. They're bouncing around in the gas state. How much energy does it take to remove an electron from an atom that is in the gas state? Well, this is an endothermic process because remember, endothermic means um, heat enters. So when heat is, uh, whenever a process requires um, putting energy into a system, then we call that an endothermic process. So if I'm going to remove an electron, which takes energy, then I have to, I have to take, uh, which requires energy, I should say, then the, re the energy required must be absorbed by the system. We call that endothermic when it absorbs energy. So um, the valence electrons are the easiest to remove. We, if we are talking about this lithium ion, this lithium atom, it's much easier to remove this electron here than it is to remove these. Because first of all, it's on the outside, and we're going to remove from the outside first. And second of all, because it feels a far lower effective nuclear charge. This electron is only held on by plus one. These electrons are held on by plus three. So if, if we're going to remove an electron from this atom, it's going to be this outside one. This is one's the easiest to remove. So the way that we diagram this reaction is by showing that um, a metal has a, a, a metal plus the ionization energy uh, as reactants. And this is going to go to the metal as a cation plus the electron. So if I start with a neutral atom, then, and I add the ionization energy to that neutral atom, then adding the ionization energy is giving it enough energy to remove the electron. And when the electron comes off, then I'm left with a plus one cation. I can also talk about the second ionization energy. The first ionization energy is starting with a neutral atom and turning it to a plus one cation. The second ionization energy is removing the second electron. So that's when I start with a plus one cation that's already had one electron removed, and I remove another electron to make a two plus cation. And these are the electrons that we remove. We start here, and then the process happens, and we end here.
So um, let's look at this chart. We can see that for hydrogen, removing an electron takes this much, but for helium, removing an electron takes much more. When we go down and we go to the next row, lithium it takes much less to remove than, he than hydrogen, um, but it starts to go up as we go across the row. Lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon. And again, neon is the highest in that row. It has the highest ionization energy. So that means that if I'm taking electrons away from an atom, it's really hard to take an electron away from helium. It's really hard to take an electron away from neon. It's really hard to take an electron away from argon. All of the noble gases seem to be on the top here. Why is it really hard to take an electron away from a noble gas? Well, because remember, noble gases have completely filled shells, and that's very stable. The reason that noble gases don't make bonds with other atoms is because they have a full sh valence shell. They have eight electrons in their valence shell, and that's very stable. And so removing an electron from a very, very stable shell takes a lot of energy. It takes more energy than any other atom because it's very hard to disrupt a stable system. Stable systems want to remain stable. It's hard to disrupt them. On the other hand, at the very beginning of each row, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, these are all the alkali metals. These are in the first column. The noble gases are in the last column. They have the highest ionization energy. The alkali metals are in the first column on the periodic table. They have the lowest ionization energy. How many valence electrons does lithium have? One. If we remove the valence electron from lithium, the one valence electron in lithium, then what happens is underneath it has two electrons and it looks just like helium. That's why lithium is often an, an Li plus cation. It loses one electron, looks like helium. Sodium, it loses one electron, looks like neon. Potassium, it loses one electron, it looks like argon. So what this chart is telling us is that it's very hard to take electrons away from noble gases, their ionization energy. They have very high ionization energy. It's very easy to take electrons away from alkali metals. They have a very low ionization energy. It does not take much energy to remove their electrons. It does take a lot of energy to remove these electrons. So we can see across a row, lithium is the lowest, and there's a couple of exceptions where it goes up and then down a little bit, for the, but for the most part, the trend is up. Lithium is the lowest, neon is the highest. Sodium is the lowest, argon is the highest. So at the beginning of the row, that has the lowest ionization energy, and at the end of the row, we have the highest ionization energy. So there's some irregularities here and here, and we can look at that. This is beryllium boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. So nitrogen, oxygen seem to be a little bit off. Nitrogen is higher than it should be. And lithium, beryllium, boron, beryllium is higher than it should be, right? So these, these guys are mixed up and these guys are mixed up. We can look at that. Same kind of thing is happening down here. And in the transition elements, when we get into that 3D period on the periodic table, these kind of bounce up and down a lot too. And it's really for the same reason that these are. So let's, let's get into that a little bit. If we look at the trends in ionization energy, this chart is pretty much showing us the same thing, just in a different graphic. That um, elements that are further down have lower ionization energy, right? So lithium is the highest alkali metal. Rubidium is the lowest. Oops. So lithium is the highest alkali metal. Rubidium, actually cesium, is even lower than that. So as we go down the periodic table, the ionization energy decreases. And as I go from right to left, the, the ionization energy decreases. So that shows us that down here, cesium really has the lowest ionization energy. And as we go up here into this corner, helium has the highest ionization energy. It's easiest to remove an electron from cesium. It's hardest to remove an electron from helium. It's easy to remove an electron from cesium. It's easy to remove an electron from cesium because the electron is in the seventh shell. One, two, three, four, five, oh, the sixth shell. Francium is in the seventh shell. The electron in cesium is in the sixth shell, 
and it has five shells of electrons underneath. That means the effective nuclear charge that that, valent, that one electron feels, the valence electron in cesium, is very low because it's right on the outside and it doesn't feel very much of the positive charge in the nucleus. So as we go down the periodic table, the shielding of electrons underneath increases. Um, as we go this way on the periodic table, as I go from left to right across a, a row, the reason that it increases here is because we're starting to, uh, at some point, go in the opposite direction. So what I mean by that is that elements want to have a full valence shell. The reason that these, um, that these elements have a very low ionization energy, much lower than everyone else, is because if they get rid of that electron, they do have a full valence shell. The reason that these elements really don't want to get rid of an electron is because if they get rid of an electron, you're destroying their full valence shell. So when you get rid of their electron, you create a full valence shell underneath. And when you get rid of theirs, you're destroying what, what the full valence shell that's already there. So what we do as we go from left to right is add electrons. So as I'm adding electrons to, be, to create a full stable shell, it costs more and more energy to remove those electrons until I finally get to neon where it costs the most energy in that row. So here's why beryllium and boron are different. Um, beryllium and boron, we said, were that first zigzag here. Lithium, beryllium, boron. It should be like beryllium, boron, right? Boron should be higher, not lower. And then it goes boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. Oxygen should be higher, not lower. So there's something going on here. So this is the idea, is in beryllium, if I'm going to take an electron away from beryllium, then I have to disrupt a full subshell. A full subshell is one that uh, has all of the electrons are, are, are filled. So in the 2s subshell, I can only fit two electrons. So this is a full subshell. So if I take one of these electrons away, I'm breaking up a full subshell. That's kind of like breaking up a noble gas. This right here is kind of like a mini noble gas. A noble gas is where the whole shell is filled, not just a subshell. The whole shell is filled in a noble gas. But in beryllium, this subshell is filled. So to take away an electron in beryllium takes more energy than we might think because we're breaking up a completely filled subshell. In boron, I have five electrons. So I have this full subshell here, and then I have one extra electron in 2p. To take away this electron in boron uh, is actually underneath, I have a full subshell. So if I remove this electron, then underneath I get a particularly stable situation. So removing this electron is not so bad. It leaves me with a good situation, which is a full subshell. Removing this electron is really bad, because then it leaves me with a bad situation, which was taking a full subshell and making it unfull. This is removing this, and underneath I have a full subshell. So the point is that beryllium takes more energy than we might expect, and boron takes less energy than we might expect. So boron is actually, or beryllium is actually higher up here than it should be, and boron is actually lower down here than it should be. So that throws off the order of these. And that same thing happens down here in the next row. So the first ionization energy is removing the first electron. So that's turning a neutral atom into a plus one cation. We can also measure the second ionization energy, and that's where I turn a plus one cation into a plus two cation. The second ionization energy is always higher for every element than the first ionization energy. It's always easier to take the first electron than it is to take the second. It's hard to take electron away from something that's already positive. It's really hard to take an electron away from something that already has a plus two charge. Making that plus charge get higher and higher and higher from plus one to plus two to plus three as I keep removing electrons, that gets harder and harder and harder to do. So that's what we can see here. Sodium, it's really easy to remove the first electron in sodium. Removing the second electron in sodium is 10 times harder. And removing the third electron in sodium is 50% uh, harder than that. 
And same with magnesium. Removing the first electron on magnesium is not bad. Even removing the second electron on magnesium because um, we know that sodium, let's, let's look at this graphically for a minute. Actually has three. Magnesium, one, two, three. All right, and let's put some electrons on here. So sodium, one, two, the first shell is full. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The second shell is full, and sodium has one electron in the third shell. Magnesium has one, two, first shell is full. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The second shell is full. Magnesium has one, two, Supposed to be on the third. <laughs> Not much better. Okay, on the third shell here. So when I remove the first electron on sodium, that's not so bad. Because when I remove that first electron, what do I get underneath? I get a full subshell. Removing one electron from sodium, underneath I still have eight electrons. So now that makes Na plus, that's not so bad. But to get from Na plus to Na2 plus, then I have to break up this, sub sh this full shell. Now I'm going from eight in this full shell, and I remove one. Now I have seven. That's a bad situation. That, that sodium was happy when it had eight in that outer shell. Na2 plus, now he's not happy. He doesn't like being two plus, because now, now it has seven in the outer shell. And if I go to Na3 plus, then I'm going to take this away, and it only has six in the outer shell. It's going to make him even sadder. So magnesium, what happens when I take away one from magnesium? Well, I get magnesium plus one. But magnesium has two in the outer shell. So what happens when I take away the second one from magnesium? Well, now its outer shell is completely empty. So magnesium two plus is happy. Because now magnesium 2 plus, it lost its two outer electrons, and now it has a full shell underneath. But magnesium 3 plus, look how much energy it takes to remove that third electron. Why? Because if I remove that third electron, now I'm breaking up magnesium's full shell. It went from having 2, 4, 6, 8, now it only has 7 in that outer shell. So when I make magnesium 3 plus, that makes him sad. Now he's sad broke up the full shell. So it's easy to, to create an element that has a full shell of electrons underneath, an ion with a full shell underneath. It's hard to create an ion where I'm breaking up that full shell. And really, when you think about it, that's exactly what we just said about this situation. It's hard to break up this full shell. It's easy to break up this one where I'm left with a full shell. With nitrogen, I have one, two, three, that's a half shell, that's stable. It's hard to break up a half shell that's already stable. With oxygen, I have this one extra here. If I lose that and I create a half shell, that's good. So O plus is happy because now it has a, a, full, a full or a half filled subshell. So filled subshells and half filled subshells are particularly stable. But breaking up of a completely filled shell and breaking up a half filled shell is bad. That leads to a very high energy. Electron affinity is kind of like the opposite of ionization energy. Ionization energy is when I take an electron away from an atom and I make that neutral atom, I turn it into a plus because I removed an electron from it. With electron affinity, I'm taking an atom and I'm giving it an electron. I'm putting an another electron on top of it. So here I start with a neutral atom, and I give it an electron, and then instead of becoming positive, now it becomes negative. And instead of costing energy to pull the electron away, now energy is released because I'm giving it an electron that releases energy. The, the electron is attracted to the, to the atom. So that's like the opposite of trying to pull it away. That's like letting it uh, letting go of it and having it stick to the atom, which releases energy. So electron affinity is, is defined as exothermic. Uh, but in some cases, it might actually be endothermic. 
So some alkali earth metals and all noble gases are endothermic when we're talking about adding an electron to them. And why do you think that might be? Well, for the same exact reason we were just talking about. A noble gas has a full shell. If I add an electron to it, I'm breaking its full shell. I'm making another shell that's not full. That takes energy. That's taking it from a very stable situation to one that's not so stable. So that takes energy. Alkali earth metals, well, they have two shells and they have two electrons in their s orbital. So that means they have a completely filled subshell. So if I add an electron to a completely filled subshell, that's also taking a, a particularly stable situation and creating one that's not as stable. So that takes energy as well. Uh, the more energy that is released, even though sometimes, as we just said, it might even be absorbed, but the more energy that is released during this, pro uh, during this reaction, the larger the electron affinity. So here's some examples of electron affinity. So remember when energy is released, it has a negative sign. When energy is absorbed, it has a positive sign. So since this is a... Um, a uh, since this um, system releases energy when we're giving an electron to an atom, we put a negative sign to show how much energy is released. So um, electron affinity generally is low for metals, and it gets lower and lower and lower as we go down. And it's higher for nonmetals. It gets higher as I go from the left to the right, and it gets higher as I go from the bottom to the top, even though, again, there's still some anomalies. So Chlorine, negative 349, is even more negative than fluorine. Uh, metallic character is how closely an element's properties match the ideal properties of a metal. So uh, the properties of a metal are being malleable, which is where you can hit it with a hammer and it will become flat. Um, metals are ductile, which means that you can pull them between two, like pull them between your hands if you were really, really strong and you could pull the metal into a wire. It will get, uh, if you try to pull a rock and you put enough pressure on it, it will just break. But if you try to pull a metal, it will get thinner and thinner and thinner and kind of pull into, um, into a wire. Metals are good conductors of heat and electricity and metals are really easy to become cations. They uh, lose electrons very easily. They ionize very easily. So metallic character is kind of similar to some of these properties we've already been talking about, um, electron affinity uh, and, um, and ionization energy becoming an ion, right? So um, it shouldn't be a surprise that metallic character um, and uh, ionization energy have the same trend. So the more metallic something is, so metallic character increases from the right to the left, and it increases from the top to the bottom. So francium here is the most metallic. Francium also has the lowest ionization energy. So ionization energy and metallic character are the same. This is the most metallic and the lowest ionization energy. Um, helium is the least metallic, and it has the highest ionization energy. So metals generally have smaller first ionization energies, and nonmetals generally have larger electron affinities. So those are some things we can say, and that's generally what, what causes a metal to be a metal, is that it doesn't hold on to its electrons very tightly. And what causes a nonmetal to be a nonmetal is that it does hold on to electrons very tightly. So the, those opposite behaviors are what leads to the opposite properties of metals and nonmetals. Um, Quantum mechanics predicts the atom's metallic character should increase down a column because the valence electrons are not held as tightly, that the ones on the outside don't, aren't held as tightly as the ones on the inside. And quantum mechanics also predicts the atom's metallic character should decrease across a period because the valence electrons are held more strongly as we go across a row, and that's for reasons we already talked about, which is when uh, as the nuclear charge in the middle, in the nucleus, gets higher, we add protons. That pulls on that shell of electrons tighter and tighter and tighter, and that eventually goes from being a metal to being what we would call a nonmetal. 
So here is that same chart from the beginning that shows all of these periodic trends that we just talked about, and they're all summed up in this one graphic. So electronegativity, this has the lowest electronegativity. Oh, we didn't talk about electronegativity, but it's very similar to electron affinity, and we looked at that a little bit uh, in an earlier chapter. So we can just say electron affinity here instead. Oh, it's right down here. So electron affinity, this has the lowest electron affinity, francium, and fluorine and uh, helium have the highest electron affinity, um, or he fluorine does when we're talking about electron affinity because, as we already said, adding an electron to a noble gas is an endothermic process. Um, francium is the most metallic, right? It got metallic character increases down here. And uh, fluorine is the least metallic, or helium is the least metallic. Uh, helium is the smallest atom all the way up here, and francium is the largest atom, the atomic radius. So understanding the way that uh, periodic trends either increase or decrease across a column or across a row on the periodic table, uh, really just memorizing this graphic is a good way to answer questions when you're trying to rank the size of atoms or their ionization energy, etc. So rank these atoms by increasing electronegativity. So um, electronegativity is uh, similar to electron affinity. We can see actually that they have the same trend here. They follow the same trend. Electron affinity is how much an atom likes electrons. I give it an electron and it releases energy. The more energy it releases, the more it likes electrons. So atoms that have a high electron affinity like electrons. We can say that atoms that have a high electronegativity also like electrons. The only difference between electron affinity and electronegativity is that electron affinity is how much one single atom likes an electron if I give one atom an electron. Electronegativity is a measurement of how much an atom in a bond, when two atoms are stuck together, they're bonded together, like H2, um, which, um, or let's say HCl, which atom in the bond H and Cl, which atom is the electron drawn to more, the H or the Cl? That's a measurement of electronegativity. So it's very similar to electron affinity. And it, has this, it follows the same trend. So if we are trying to uh, rank these by increasing electronegativity, then we need to have a periodic table. go let's let's find these oops uh, here is uh, radium down here CR chromium is right here a s arsenic is right here s sulfur and F fluorine all right so the uh, if we're talking about electronegativity increasing electronegativity we want the one that's the least electronegative so that's down here. Francium is the least electronegative. Well, radium is right next to it. So we're going to say radium is the least electronegative. And then if, we're go if we go from here to here and electronegativity increases this way, then the next one that we meet along that line is chromium. So chromium is the next most electronegative. And then as we're going from here, we pass radium, and then we pass chromium, and then we pass arsenic. Arsenic is the, the lowest and the furthest to the left. So AS. And then we come to SS, which is a little bit higher and a little bit further to the right. And then we come to F, which is a little bit higher and a little bit further to the right still. So we just draw an arrow from here to here. And we see, well, radium is the closest to this side. And then chromium is the next closest to this side and then arsenic, and then sulfur, and then fluorine. So just look at the arrow and try to put these elements in order along that arrow. And that's how we look at periodic trends. All right, let's look at this next one. Rank these atoms by increasing radius. All right, so let's see if I can squeeze this guy down a little bit. <laughs> 
All right, K. So remember the smallest atoms are up here and the largest atoms are down here. So um, we have CL and AL are in this row and NA is in the third row, K is in the fourth row, CA is in the fourth row. All right, so the smallest atom, if we look at the th atoms in the third row are smaller than those in the fourth row. So Na is in the third row, and magnesium is in the third row, and aluminum is in the third row, and chlorine is in the third row. So in the third row, which one is the smallest? Argon. So chlorine is the next smallest in the third row. It's the smallest of this whole set. So then, as I go this way, they get bigger. Aluminum is next. So then... Magnesium is next, then sodium. And then I have calcium and potassium. So now I go down to the fourth row. All the ones in the fourth row are bigger than the ones in the third row. But which one's bigger, potassium or calcium? Well, potassium is because this one is the biggest in this row. So then it's going to go Ca and potassium is the biggest in this whole in this whole uh set here. Rank these ions by increasing radius. Okay, so let's look at Ca2+. Oops, hold on, let me get rid of this thing. Ca2+, that's right here. If it loses two electrons, Ca is going to have as many, one, two, it's going to have as many electrons as argon. Cl minus, that gain, it's Cl that gains an electron. If Cl gains an electron, it's going to have the same number of electrons as argon. K plus, if K loses an electron, one electron, it's going to have the same number of electrons as argon. See where I'm going? S2 minus, if S gains two electrons, one, two, it's going to look just like argon. P, three minus, P, one, two, three, then it's going to look just like argon. So all of these ions have exactly the same number of electrons. So if they have the, exactly the same number of electrons, then how do I rank them by increasing radius? Well, they don't have the same number of protons. The, if they all have the same number of electrons, which happens to be 18 electrons, the one that has the fewest protons pulls the least hard, and the one that has the most protons pulls the hardest, and which would have the lowest the smallest radius. So which one of these has the most protons? Calcium does. So calcium, if calcium, oops, if calcium has the most protons, then calcium is the biggest. Excuse me, and calcium is the smallest. If calcium has the most protons, then calcium pulls on those 18 electrons harder than anyone else because calcium has 20 protons. So it pulls on 18 electrons really hard. It makes that ion really small. The next one is going to be potassium. It has 19 protons. And then chlorine. It has 17 protons. And then sulfur. It only has 16 protons. And then phosphorus. It only has 15 protons. So phosphorus is the biggest. It has 15 protons and 18 electrons. So that makes a really, really big ion. Calcium is the smallest because it has 18 electrons and 20 protons, which makes it, which pulls on those electrons and makes them really small.